Yeah, I came to writing about science as a science person. So I wasn't planning to be a writer. To me, it all started with science. And I often tell my students that I think it's incredibly valuable as a writer to have a sort of specialty, um, just in terms of actually making a living and get to t getting to tell the stories you want to tell. But then I also say, in terms of my own writing, that when I talk to the public, I say, I just tell stories. I tell really amazing stories that capture me, and it's that following your curiosity. Uh, that I use that line all the time. That I, that's what I get to do for a living. And these sort of happen to be about science is the way I like to pitch them to people, because people are often afraid of reading about science. And I think, to me, the, the fact that I get to write about science is, you know, there's a sort of mission behind it for me. I think it's so important for people to have access to scientific information, you know, in your day-to-day -day life, whether it's people going to the doctor, or voting for, you know, whichever presidential candidate, science, are always, it's always part of the campaigns, and making decisions in, constantly throughout life has to do with science, but so many people have a, this enormous sort of barrier between them and science. So to me, this storytelling is about, it's a vehicle to get people to understand the science that I think that everyone needs to understand. In some ways, you are so tied up yeah. with the story, there, and there are some very unscientific reasons that you describe as, mm -hmm. as to the, the curious power that the story has. So talk about that a little bit. Do you mean the sort of supernatural? Yeah, that, 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 yeah. Okay. <laughs> I mean, those lacks, they yeah. understand the world in a different way than I yeah, do, that's absolutely. for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, so the story is about the first immortal human cells that were ever grown in culture, and they were taken from Henrietta Lacks in the 50s without her knowledge. She died soon after. And to her family, who they had no scientific background at all. They had no basic education. Her husband didn't even know what a cell was. So when he first found out these cells were alive decades after her death, he thought they had her alive in a lab, in a cell, like a prison cell. <laughs> that was his frame of reference for a cell. And for them, she was the Lord's first immortal being. She, if you read the Bible and the description of you know, immortality in the Bible, you know, she, to them, she was an angel brought back to life to take care of people and cure diseases and like occasionally cause problems if you piss her off. And, um, and Because certain, they understood that her tissue continued to live. They, right, so eventually they came to understand that the cells were not all of her, but they were part of her. And mm. her DNA was in there alive, even though she was, she was dead. And, and at a certain point, they came to believe that I had, she had sort of picked me and essentially been working me as a puppet my whole life, like go over here and study science, go over here and study writing, and, and driving this story to happen. Um, and when I first started working on the book, you know, I am a science person. I don't, I had never entertained the idea of cells being an actual person who's still alive outside, you know, in a lab, and that their soul could somehow be alive in these cells. And also, I'm not a religious person. The Blackstone family was deeply <coughs> religious. And one of the big lessons for me in this story was, you know, we often talk about science versus religion and the ways that these things are at odds. And with the Lax family, I saw the way that their faith and their belief in this sort of supernatural really helped them find a way to understand the science and kind well, of opened it up to them. The way you include that in the story, and there are, I'll, I'll have a couple of examples of that a little bit later, um, uh, in, in surprising ways just added so much humanity the story, for those of you who don't know uh, the, the science of, of her cells, and probably most of you do know that, is, is that the, the, the cancer that she had continued to reproduce over and over and over again, and it made a tissue culture that was continually usable and therefore testable for all kinds of medical research uses, and became a commodity, almost like an agricultural commodity, like uh, you know saffron or something like that, really valuable. People wanted it, only incredibly much more valuable. And uh, the family saw no uh, benefit from that, and we'll talk about what that meant uh, a little bit later. The, the mission is to tell human stories. You can't get much better than this from page 266 of uh, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. This is a scene that, as you read this book, uh, Rebecca, you, you wonder if it actually exists, this scene. You wonder if it can actually, if, if this journalist, this writer can actually witness such a scene, and in fact, you do. And basically, you connect Christoph, who's a, a doctor, a cancer an oncology researcher, researcher yeah. oncology, yeah, who's a very, who, who's had a bit of a soul searching about uh, what the scientific community has done with the cells of Henrietta Lacks uh, throughout this time, and has gone to see Deborah, Henrietta's daughter, and Zachariah is Zachariah. A Zachariah. Zachariah, who is the son. I won't tell him you said yes. it like okay, that. Yes, okay, Zachariah. Um, and, and Christoph actually 
And I'll just read the words. Taught Deborah and Zachariah how to use the microscope, saying, look through like this. Take your glasses off. Now turn this knob to focus. Finally, the cells popped into view for Deborah. And through that microscope, for that moment, all she could see was an ocean of her mother's cells, stained an ethereal fluorescent green. They're beautiful, she whispered, then went back to staring at the slide in silence. Eventually, without looking away from the cells, she said, God, I never thought I'd see my mother under a microscope. I never dreamed this day would ever come. It's a line you should say for the movie, by the way. <laughs> yeah, Hopkins pretty much screwed up, I think, Kristoff said, that's the oncologist, and Deborah bolted upright and looked at him, stunned to hear a scientist, one at Hopkins, no less, saying such a thing. Then she looked back into the microscope and said, John Hopkins is a school for learning, and that's important, but this is my mother. Nobody seemed to get that. That's amazing stuff. What was it like to be in that room? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it was one of the most sort of incredible and emotional, uh, sort of overwhelming moments in the reporting, I and mean, there were so many of them. But that, you know, there had been such a build up to that moment. I had been working on the book for over six years at that point, and, you know, it took me about a year and a half just to get Deborah to talk to me. She we had one phone call where she was really excited about the idea of somebody writing a book about her mother and the cells, but, and I said, well, maybe then I'll be able to learn what the cells actually did in science. No one had ever explained anything to the family. Um, maybe I'll be able to learn who my mother was. But then, sort of in the next breath, she's like, but how do I know you're really a journalist? How do I know you're not coming to steal my cells? And I was like, what? Why would you possibly think that? And then she essentially hung up on me and then wouldn't talk to me for a year and a half. And in that moment, you know, there are these things when I when I talk about the sort of origins of a lot of my stories, they always start with something that I call a what moment, like something that just makes me stop and go, wait, what? What did you just say? And that was a big one for me. The you know the first one was just learning about Henrietta's cells in the first place. And there's this woman, and she's been dead since the 50s, but her cells are still around, and they're one of the most important things that happened to medicine. But you know her family didn't know, and that sort of moment, I just went, wait. And my I learned about her in biology class at 16, and. My teacher wrote her name on the board and said she was a black woman, and that was it. And I was like, what? Why do we just know that? <laughs> like, that's it? And I went up to him and said, what else do we know? And he was just like, sorry, that's all we know about her. Um, and so that was sort of my first, the, the first moment in this that grabbed my curiosity. And then the rest, so much of the rest of reporting for me is just following the curiosity. So when I first called Deborah, I thought I was writing a story about Henrietta and these amazing cells. And then that moment on the phone when Deborah said, how do I know you're really a journalist? How do I know you're not coming to steal my cells? I could hear how she was so excited to talk to me and so terrified at the same time. And I just, it was another big what moment where I said, I have to figure out why she's so afraid of me. What, this something else happened in this story. This isn't just about Henrietta. Something happened to her kids. And really, the immortal life of Henrietta Lacks is sort of the legacy of the cells and the impact on her children. It turned out they had been used in research without their knowledge in the um, 70s in order to learn more about the cells and scientists never told them that they were used in research. So really it's a story of multiple generations of a family used in research. And so for Deborah, just, you know, it took years to get her to, get her to talk to me and then to win her trust and there was just kind of constant moments where she would push me away, sometimes literally physically threw me against a wall, like, who sent you? Um, and then she would calm down, and she would always come back to me and say, I know this has all got to go in the book. This is not about you. This is part of the story of what happened when the world got Gila cells, and I lost my mother, which is everyone has benefited personally from this. Vaccines, you know, you've got a kid born through IVF, like whatever it is, it, everyone has benefited in multiple ways, except her family. In many, they didn't have access to medical care. They didn't get the money that people made off of it. So. There was this long process of over years of sort of winning her trust and and building up in some ways to that. That was the first of sort of three moments that we had together that um, really changed the story for me and for her. And it, but for her, walk voluntarily walking through the doors of Hopkins was the most terrifying thing you could do. So in, in East Baltimore to this day, if you grow up there and you're a black child, you grow up hearing that you don't go out on the street at night you don't go out on the streets after dark because Hopkins will snatch you and take you in the basement and do research on you and you'll never come out. And this is something that dates back to you know slavery time and, and you know after that when there were these things that people referred to as night doctors and they did do research on African Americans. There's a long history of this. And, but Hopkins never 
did that directly, but it sort of, there were a lot of other things it did to, to in, engender a lot of mistrust in the community. After the book came out, I did a speak, one of my first speaking events there. Um, I walked out of my, out of the event afterwards, there was a girl, she was about 13 years old, waiting outside the building to talk to me. And she came up, she's like, I'm so excited to talk to you, I have all these questions, and I, and I said, well, you, why, you know, I was like, you should have come, it was me. And she said, oh, I can't go into Hopkins because they'll take me in the basement and mm. I'll never go home. Mm. And so it, it's that alive today, I mean, this was just a few years ago. And so, you know, so Deborah grew up in that and grew up knowing they'd done something to Henrietta and there was a lot of questions about whether they'd given her cancer in order to do the research, which they hadn't, but, so for her to just walk through those doors into a research lab, wow took an amount of courage that I had sort of never really even imagined or seen before. And and she did it with this incredible grace and you know, she was afraid, but she was it was a beautiful thing. And the moment right before that part you read, she actually saw the cells in a refrigerator for the first time. The researcher opened it and there were just these hundreds of vials of helo cells and he was explaining to her what these cells were and she t he handed her a vial and she took it and she sort of rubs it in her hands and starts blowing on it and saying, you know, she's cold because she's been in the free refrigerator. And then she starts talking to her mother. She just picks up the cells and starts talking to it as if it's her mother. And then that was sort of the next thing that happened was he said, let me come show them to you outside of that tube. She also asked the question, I, I believe, how come they're not black? That was her brother, yeah. 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 And that was, you know, that was a, I think for Christoph, that was an incredible revelation. I mean, he didn't, if you don't know what a cell is and you've grown up in the South, you know, uh, in the midst of segregation, and you know, it never crossed her son's mind that her cells didn't look black, just like you know her skin. And it was a beautiful moment. And Christoph was an, is an amazing scientist. I mean, he was he reached out to me and said I I had, I had written a news a magazine article about Henrietta, and he was like I did my dissertation on these cells. Everything I've done in my career, I did with these cells, and I feel like I owe so much to her and I'm sort of horrified that no one's ever explained these cells to them. Can you bring them to me, and can I explain this to them, please? And it was a beautiful thing to watch, and he was so excited, and they, they were just sort of laughing at him at various points because he was so giddy. It was like Bruce Springsteen had just walked in the, his lab when, when Henrietta's son walked in. He was just beside himself, and they'd just never been taken seriously before. So there were so many things in that moment that were happening, and I, sort of as a journalist, was just, you know, experiencing all that, and at that point I'd known the family for so long, I knew what this meant for them. If you could reference the, what you learned about yeah. the interplay between it, ethics and science yeah. and law, that's really such a powerful piece in your book. Yeah, I mean, I think in a, in a lot of ways, like Dan said, no book is about one thing, and you know, my book is about a lot of things, and one of the things it's about is communication about science, and what can go wrong when it fails. Because basically everything that happened to the Lax family that was traumatic for them happened because someone didn't or couldn't communicate something to them, but also because they, in some situations, couldn't hear it. They were just shut down um, to asking questions. They were terrified, yeah, which was no fault of their own. It's just sort of part of a much larger story. But in a lot of ways, this, the whole that story is about why it's important that we do what we do, why it's important that readers are open to receiving it. And I think that, you know, Everything I write about has, is usually at this intersection where science impacts daily life, where things get messy, and where there's just no easy answer. And I think the one thing that I've come to with, as I have traveled and talked about this book and the story, is I feel like one of the responsibilities that readers have, I mean, being skeptical, which is sort of what you, one of the things you were talking about, I think is essential, but also not demanding easy answers from science. And I hear over and over again, people want me to say, but was this right or was this wrong? Do they deserve money? Do they not deserve money? We, you know, were the scientists bad or were they good? And you cannot say that. And really, at its core, science is about, it, it is always messy. And there is never a sort of right wrong. It's always being revised. You know, does red wine prevent cancer or does it cure cancer? Does it, you know, and, and I think the public's demand for, like, you know, this solid answer with science can often get the public in trouble, and it also journalists get into trouble because then they want to, they, they they try to answer those questions, and they're just they don't the answers don't always exist. And so I think being open to learning about science, while also being open to the fact that yeah the answers may not be as clear as you want them to be, and they often probably aren't exactly what you want them to be, and that you know and when it changes a year from now, that doesn't mean that everything before it was 
sort of a, a, a scam and it was wrong, it means that's how science works. Right. They follow the facts and this is what the facts are right now and then somebody goes, oh wait, those facts were wrong. Like those, th that data that we've always believed was the fact, it was actually wrong and so we revise it. And so science, just like science writing, is all about following the story and being open to where it's taking you. Mm -hmm.